In the previous video, we took a peek at the peak value, the peak to peak value and the average value of a sinusoidal signal. In the domain of electrical engineering and in audio as well, averages are quite important. And the instantaneous peaks? Well, not so much. Though we looked at a simple average calculation of a sinusoid in the earlier video, that isn't how the effective average of a signal is calculated. The reason for this is basically dependent on what we are trying to find when calculating the average. A very important aspect of a signal is the energy that it carries over time. That's the power of the signal within a given period of time. And the RMS value, or the root mean square value, is needed when calculating the energy associated with the given signal. Let's back up here before we get carried away. We'll put a few bullet points here about the topics that we need to discuss to fully understand what we just termed as RMS value. We'll get to each one of these in turn. The very first thing that we need to talk about is just a brief summary of some electrical theory to discuss the power drawn from a resistive load in the circuit. This seems like an off-the-board topic and doesn't seem related to audio, but we are indeed talking about electrical audio signals in the analog domain, so some discussion of this is warranted. Next, we'll derive the equation for what we refer to as the RMS value of voltage, and we'll visualize what it means and what it looks like. Next, we'll look at the RMS values for some common waveforms and signals, including sinusoids, square waves, triangle waves, and some others. Finally, we'll talk about what an RMS value or average value means in the context of audio signals and the sounds that we listen to. So why is RMS calculations needed in the first place? This section of electrical theory is going to be very brief and limited. And if you are interested in more of this, I'd highly recommend an Electronics 101 lecture, mainly along the topics of Ohm's Law and Watt's Law. There are plenty of good explainer videos on YouTube. Let's say there's a DC voltage source of around 5 volts applied to a resistive load, like a light bulb. The light bulb would draw some amount of current from the source, let's say around 2 amps. We can calculate that the bulb draws a power of 10 watts. So the bulb is rated to 10 watts. We can do this because this is a DC source and the voltage drop is constant and doesn't change. And we can assume that the current drawn is constant as well. The instantaneous power drawn from the source, that is the power drawn at any given time, is always the same. But what if we were to replace the DC source with an AC source. The AC source is by definition an alternating source of current, and in simple cases uh, is a sinusoid of 50 to 60 hertz, much like our test signal that we've been discussing the topic with. What's the power drawn by the bulb? How do we calculate that? Well, if we apply the formula as is, the instantaneous power would keep changing as the voltage and current oscillates. Since AC is typically a periodic function, it makes more sense to calculate the average power drawn instead. So the average power, or the mean power, is basically the mean of the instantaneous power. Since we're assuming that it's a purely resistive load, by using Ohm's law we can substitute current here with voltage divided by the resistance. Since resistance is constant and the average doesn't really apply to the resistance, we have the following formula. In essence, what we are theoretically trying to do here is to replace an AC source with an equivalent DC source, such that the average power drawn by the bulb would be the same in both cases. If we go by that principle, the equivalent DC source would be equal to the square root of the mean of the squares of the instantaneous AC voltage. And this is where the term RMS comes from. It is the root of the mean of the squares. So basically, RMS voltage value is just the DC equivalent of an AC source. So there's a bit of theory for you from an electrical engineering perspective on where the RMS value comes from. It might not seem very relevant to you from an audio engineering perspective, 
but RMS measurements are dominant everywhere. For example, the output voltage of the electrical mains in your home, which is uh, 110 volts in the States, or 220 volts everywhere else, that's the RMS value that's been indicated. The peak voltage of a 110 volt RMS main is around 170 volts, and the peak to peak voltage is twice that, around 340 volts. These are values that you hardly ever see. Similarly, on the spec sheets of all audio electronic equipment like amplifiers and powered speakers, their voltage and current ratings and operating conditions, unless otherwise stated, are all RMS values. A multimeter when measuring AC voltage is giving you a calculated RMS value. A VU meter, which measures the levels of audio signals on onboard analog mixers, they calculate and show you the RMS voltage of the audio signal being passed through. The RMS measurements are everywhere, and we'll soon be calculating and using them as well. But it's good to be grounded in its roots and sort of appreciate where it comes from. So, let's look at the formula for calculating the RMS value. Here it is. It looks a bit complicated, but it really isn't. Just think about the abbreviation when in doubt. Root mean square. This formula has all of that in that particular order. Similar exercise as the video before, let's go into the Desmos graphing calculator and try to visualize this. So let's create a function definition, f of t equal to sine of t, which is basically a sine function over time. As you can see, the function completes its period every 2 pi interval of time. We now know that RMS is root mean squared, but let's go backwards when analyzing. Squared. We square the function f of t. The square of any number is always a positive number, and so the function is restricted to the positive amplitude axis. Next, we have the mean, and the mean is basically the average of all of the values of this function over its period. So we integrate this function with respect to the time over the period of 0 to 2 pi. Let's define the period as t equal to 2 pi, and then apply the integration. Once we've integrated it, we need to divide it by the period. This is because the mean or the average is basically the sum of the values divided by the number of values being summed. Finally, we take the root or the square root of the right hand side, and we get the final result. The RMS value of a period of a sinusoid is around 0 0.707, which is basically the peak value, which is one in this case, divided by root two. This is applicable for all sinusoids. For all sinusoids, the RMS value is one over root two of the peak value. Let's look at another type of signal, a triangle wave. This is a perfect triangle waveform and isn't a combination of sinusoidal harmonics like it should be, but it's fine for this demonstration. As you can see, the value of the RMS is around 0.577, which is the peak amplitude divided by root 3. Let's look at a square wave now. Again, this is an approximation of an idealistic square wave, and isn't a combination of sinusoidal harmonics in the general sense. But it works for this demonstration of calculating the RMS. And as you can see, the RMS is around 1. It isn't quite 1, because it's not a perfect square wave, but it tends towards 1. That means, for a square wave, the RMS value is equal to the peak value. Summing up, the RMS value is based on the energy that is contained within a given signal. You can think about it as the average of a time-varying signal over a given period of time. Now the question is, how is this applicable to audio, and what does an RMS value signify in the context of audio signals? We can think about audio signals as electrical signals. In fact, they are electrical signals. Their voltage is time-bearing. Rarely are audio signals ever pure sinusoids, or even harmonics for that matter. Real-world audio signals are complex. So to find the power associated with these signals, RMS calculations are the way to go. 
But as you can imagine, complex real-world signals, like human speech, don't have any discernible periodicity associated with them. For these sort of signals, we need to apply time weighting, and we'll discuss that in a future video. But why calculate RMS at all? When we listen to sounds, we don't perceive the loudness of sounds based on the peaks that they contain. I've got two clips here. One is an uncompressed drum signal, and here's another clip which is compressed metal music. I've normalized both of these tracks such that their peaks are equal. Let's listen to them in turns. As you could hear, though the peaks are normalized, the perceived loudness of the second track is far greater than that of the first. The drum track has large transients when the drums are hit, but they decay fast. The amount of time that you experience the transient is really important for our apparent perception of loudness. Large but short transients don't sound loud to us, whereas high levels sustained over larger lengths of time do in fact sound loud. If you observe the meters here, the light green indicates the peak levels, and the darker green represents RMS levels. As you can see, when they're both played side by side, their peak levels kind of match up, but their RMS levels are way off. The RMS level, though not a perfect metric of subjective loudness, is the simplest way to get an idea of how loud a signal is. It's easy to calculate and easy to implement. It doesn't take into account the frequency aspect of the sound source, but it does take into account the temporal aspect of the sound source. In the next video, we'll explore a little more about the temporal aspect of sound. We'll see how the duration of the transients of a sound plays an integral part in determining the loudness. We'll keep the discussion of RMS going, and we'll talk about time waiting. <laughs>